So uh, I will present, uh, as David mentioned, on uh, the Genetic Discrimination Observatory, uh, which was launched uh, internationally uh, in 2019. And uh, I will start my presentation uh, by first of all, sort of doing uh, just a, a discussion on genetic discrimination for some of you, uh, it will be just uh, an introduction because you might not have heard a lot about genetic discrimination. For others of you, and I suspect a large proportion, it will be mostly an update of, of some of the most recent development. Uh, and we'll also look at it from an international perspective uh, so that we're all on the same page to the, la the latest development in genetic discrimination and some of the challenges and, and why uh, the Genetic Discrimination Observatory could help resolve many of these uh, challenges. Then we'll discuss also about some of the specifics of the observatory. Uh, what does it bring to the table? What is the plan uh, to use this uh, new organization uh, to help uh, document and, and prevent uh, genetic discrimination around the world? And, and I'll welcome all questions. Uh, so let's start by uh, agreeing on the working definition. This is the one that, that we're using at the observatory. Uh, I, I don't think that for most part, it's not very controversial. There is one part uh, that's a little bit more open to discussion and I'll, I'll single that out. Uh, so genetic discrimination involves treating differently, negatively and or unfairly profiling an individual relative to the rest of the population on the basis of actual or presumed, and I put omic data here. So, I mean, of course, genetic discrimination, when we started talking about this problem, it was really meant for genetics. And I, and I would even say that in most of the cases where we would talk about problems of genetic discrimination, it was really issues having to do with sort of monogenic, rare uh, disease, but things have evolved and changed. Uh, I mean, we now see situation where insurers are uh, getting interested in uh, the result, for example, in the field of epigenetics of the epigenetics clock, where you can tell what the epigenetic age of a person is. And, and, and that has really uh, important actuarial implication because it can really help uh, to uh, figure out uh, the risk of, of death of a person. It's a better indicator, some would say, than chronological age. Uh, other, uh, could, other tools that are uh, of interest uh, are, for example, risk prediction algorithm. Again, I mean, that would not fit in a traditional definition of genetic discrimination. I mean, risk algorithm can sometimes use both genetic and non-genetic like lifestyle information, et cetera, combine that to give you a result as to uh, your risk level compared to other individuals of developing a specific disease. So uh, I'm, I'm really proposing uh, keeping an open mind on, on exactly uh, and, and again, person, we, we're using omic data right now at the observatory, uh, but uh, do we want to eventually get to predictive health data as a whole? Is that, is that what we should be protecting against genetic disc discrimination based on predictive health information? Uh, I like to keep the name genetic discrimination because it speaks to people that's the term they've come to know. It's, it's become a, a very well-known expression in the past 20 uh, or more, I would say even 30, 35 years. Uh, so I, I do think that, that the name genetic discrimination should stay, but the definition, uh, you know, we, we might think about where we want to go with that. So why is genetic discrimination a problem? Why, I mean, you know, we, we discriminate, uh, we're being discriminated every day in our life. Sometimes we don't even notice it anymore in, in the sense that, you know, we're being categorized 
there's selection. I mean, why do some people are recommended this particular vaccine against COVID, other not, et cetera? Sometimes our discrimination is based on scientific grounds. Doesn't necessarily mean that people are, are happy about it. I mean, if you're, uh, if you're somebody that's young and, and you want to have to be vaccinated against COVID, uh, but you know the government has decided for very sound public health reason that elderly people should be vaccinated first. Uh, I mean, it makes a lot of sense from a public health ground, but personally, as a younger person that's gonna have to wait months to get vaccinated, that might not suit you. So all of that to say that that you know discrimination is is something that uh, is is quite widespread and happens in in many fields in many ways, and and it's not necessarily all bad. But why is genetic discrimination perceived as a problem? Well, first of all, uh, because individuals have no control over their own uh, genetic material. Uh, also, because it is perceived to be uh, conflicting with principles of autonomy, equity, and, and more importantly, even dignity. So basically, people have no control uh, over their genome, as we said, and they might probably not want to share that information with third parties, such as employer or insurers. Uh, and so... Uh, and, and dignity, because of course, uh, when you are being discriminated, you feel as in, uh, you actually feel excluded, oppressed, you feel stigmatized. Uh, so there is an attain to your dignity uh, in, in genetic discrimination. And, and yes, it can be conducive to oppression, not just of individual, but of whole population group. We have seen instances where a whole population group had been associated with specific genetic disease, even though they did not all have the disease, but because we knew that certain population groups were probably more likely to have uh, the gene or to have mutation in certain gene that would predispose some of their members to the, the, the disease. Uh, but we tend to sometimes generalize, and, and that can lead uh, to cases of stigmatization and oppression. Uh, it's also been used to oppress a minority population group when, uh, in some country, they are just systematically uh, forced uh, to provide genetic sample uh, for uh, forensic databases, as uh, is uh, happening uh, in China, for example. Uh, it's a source of anxiety, discomfort, and depression. Uh, there are studies documenting genetic discrimination as a source uh, of anxiety, discomfort, and depression. So there's study made with people that have been victim of genetic discrimination. And it's not a surprise. That's, that's the case with all types of, of discrimination that, that we want to prohibit, is that they have this negative impact. Probably of greater concern to you uh, in the audience is the negative impact on participation rate in genetic uh, and big data research project that genetic discrimination has because people are worried that they will be discriminated. Uh, it's one of the first reason that they would not participate in genetics and big data project is that they will say, well, is my information really protected uh, you know, or is there a risk that I can be discriminated? And sometimes even though you tell them they will be protected, uh, for some reason, there's really a negative perception and a worriness about, about the problem of genetic discrimination. And, and same thing, sometimes people, and, and this is really troublesome, will refuse genetic tests that are actually indicated for their health care because they have a family history of certain disease this nevertheless will not pass the test because they're afraid that uh, receiving uh, result that they have uh, a genetic predisposition uh, will uh, bar them from uh, insurance or employment or others or other uh, commodities and, and might even impact access for their children in the future. So uh, just coming back to again, the fact that well, should all types of discrimination, we, we said some types of discrimination may be warranted. Uh, should we 
prevent all types of genetic discrimination? Should we, is there a distinction to make? Uh, you know, some types of discrimination as a reminders are tolerated by our laws. Uh, if they're acceptable in the context of societies based on democracy, human rights, and economic liberalism. Uh, and, and it is, and the possibility for certain government agency to use genetic data as biometrics identifiers, uh, in some instances, it could contribute to making our society safer and more efficient. So for example, the use of a criminal database has certainly improved the efficiency of criminal investigations, but it has led to cases of discrimination where members of specific population group were overrepresented in those databases. Uh, so uh, it, it cuts both way. And the challenge is also, if you're gonna prevent genetic discrimination, you should really be careful again about how you're defining genetic, how you're defining what you're gonna be protecting or defending. Because if you are going with a definition that is too artificial, like many of those definitions are, then you end up uh, protecting a small subset of the population, but not necessarily the larger group, which will uh, look at the privileged protected individual and feel like they're being unfairly treated. So for example, uh, you know, you're preventing genetic uh, uh, discrimination, but if you're, uh, you know, only preventing it based on the result of genetic test uh, results, so you're basically saying, you know, a person doesn't have to communicate a genetic test results, but what happened to somebody that has passed, for example, an epigenetic test? Should that person have to communicate their result if the definition of the test that they've passed is uh, excluded from the genetic test definition? That's, that's one example. What about people that did not pass a test, but have a family history of hereditary colon cancer or hereditary breast cancer? So without passing the test, we know there's a big genetic factor there. Uh, and, and, and so they'll have to declare it. Uh, why would they declare it? And, and the people having passed the test would not have to declare the test results. So we can speak about these things later. But I'm just trying to show that it's complicated. Uh, we want to prevent genetic discrimination, but it's really challenging to adopt the perfect law there. So talking a bit more to the scope of the, of, of the problem. So again, where do we see genetic discrimination uh, manifest itself mostly? Uh, well, the, the first field I would say that usually come to the forefront when people complain about genetic discrimination uh, and express concern about that is the field of personal insurance, life insurance, health, if you don't have universal health insurance in the country, long-term care and invalidity insurance. Uh, employment is probably what comes up uh, second. Uh, there's many reasons why employers would like to have sometime the genetic information of their uh, future employees or current employees. Not all of them are bad. I mean, sometimes they, they might actually want that information uh, in order, for example, uh, to be able to uh, protect uh, some employees from environmental exposure and the damage it could do to their epigenome, for example. Employers may want to use screening tests. So, so not all of this is necessarily uh, to discriminate, but nevertheless, there's an incomfort there. Uh, crime prevention, we've mentioned it. Immigration, uh, surprisingly, uh, there's been really high profile case that are quite worrisome in the way genetic tests have been used in the context of immigration. Be happy to speak to that if you have questions later on. Uh, uh, in, in Asia, uh, genetic uh, information and test result is also quite important in the context of relationship and marriage. We know that, that many Asian countries have high population density and they have a, an history and a culture where family and children are extremely important. So uh, yes, uh, before uh, marriage, especially for women, uh, there's a lot of questions about health that, that becomes extremely important. Uh, and, and that includes questions about genetics. 
uh, and access to personal property is also a field where we sort of have seen uh, the issue of discrimination manifest itself. Now I'm saying that it is, uh, it, it, there's been occurrence in these fields. I'm not saying it is widespread. And we'll talk about the incidence of genetic discrimination uh, in a few minutes. So actually let's, let's talk to that now. Let me just backtrack to my slides. So uh, I should say there's very few strong studies on the incidence of genetic discrimination. Uh, I'll show you later on when I talk about the genetic discrimination observatory, a map uh, of all the studies that have been done on genetic discrimination. And, and you know, there are about maybe 40, 50 studies on the incidence of genetic discrimination in the ballpark. But a lot of those use rather weak methodologies uh, with strong bias that would induce strong biases uh, in the results or uh, give really incomplete results. So uh, what I did in uh, 2013 with my group is that we did a systematic review of all the studies that had been done uh, on genetic discrimination in the field of life insurance to sort of see, okay, is there really genetic discrimination in the life insurance? What's the incidence? So what we found was that the methodology used across the various studies that, that we found uh, lacked rigor and consistency. And so we couldn't do cross comparison or statistical analysis. We did find clear evidence that there was discrimination for only a very small number of classic condition. So uh, I'm talking about, for example, Huntington's disease, hereditary breast cancer, hereditary colon cancer, these types of uh, disease or in specific activity context. And uh, there was no evidence of widespread discrimination from the survey. Uh, and, and again, you can find more recent studies uh, on, on the genetic discrimination uh, observatory and you have the address there. So that's an example of, you know, looking at the incidence of genetic discrimination in the field of life insurance. Another example we can look at, but it's really a US again, experience is uh, in the context of employment. Uh, and, and we can do it in the US because the US have a law called GINA, which uh, prohibit genetic discrimination in employment. We know that in the US, uh, there is no universal health care uh, and that very often health insurance is tied to employment. And that's why uh, some employer in the past have attempted to discriminate and, and that's why GINA was adopted. Uh, and, and this, uh, and, uh, this uh, particular uh, law, uh, also uh, the US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission is where people could uh, complain uh, if uh, they feel they have been discriminated. So I took the statistics from 2020 uh, and uh, you can see that 440 complaints uh, of genetics discrimination were lodged uh, to the U.S. Uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Uh, that's an impressive number. Uh, of course, 182 of those uh, were dismissed because they didn't have sufficient basis uh, to complain. But nevertheless, we see that at least there are uh, more than hundreds of cases uh, in that particular year, again, it was a record, record year in terms of number uh, of, of individual that felt they had, that felt they had been discriminated. Uh, and so uh, that, can that can be surprising. Uh, so this, this gives you an idea. And as I said, in, uh, insurance and employment are probably the two fields where the problem is the most present. So can't say that's widespread, but uh, it, is, uh, it is an issue. Uh, and, and it is an issue specifically, I think, still now, if you're a carrier of monogenic dominant condition uh, that is serious or life-threatening. Now, what's even more preoccupying is that uh, if genetic discrimination is not widespread, concerns about it are widespread, and there are studies to attest to that, uh, such as the, st the study by Waters and, and Van Oywegen that was uh, done in 2016. Uh, and so uh, 
what the study demonstrate is that yes, the concerns about genetic discrimination are much more frequent than the actual case of discrimination uh, and, and that they're fairly widespread. And, and, and furthermore, that adoptions of laws in Europe and North America have not really reduced these concerns. And so that's an important take home message. Just adopting a law against genetic discrimination will not necessarily completely resolve the problem and you can forget about it. No, uh, there are, and, and Europe's a good example of that because I mean, there's been laws adopted to prevent genetic discrimination in many European countries, but nevertheless, uh, I'm sure that the concerns about genetic discrimination are indeed uh, quite widespread uh, still in Europe. Looking at international development now, uh, we see of course that uh, the problem of genetic discrimination uh, has been highlighted fairly early on by international organization. Uh, the UNESCO uh, already in 1997 uh, in, 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 in its initial universal declaration on the human genome and human rights, which has been extremely influential uh, at, at the national level and policy making, uh, at Article 6, you could see that, that it clearly stipulated that no one should be subjected to discrimination based on genetic characteristics intended to infringe or that would have the effect of infringing human rights, fundamental freedom, and human dignity. And that really influenced uh, the European approach, uh, which was uh, also influenced by the concept of genetic exceptionalism, which basically uh, is that idea that genetic data is a uh, race particular concern because uh, it is it has a familial nature, it is predictive, it is very complex to interpret, uh, et cetera, because of, of, of these characteristics of genetic information, uh, especially in the 1990s when, when genetic ex ex exceptionalism uh, was, was really uh, a current of thought that was quite widespread. The feeling was, okay, we need specific laws because of, gen of the special nature of genetic data that will really uh, offer a higher level of protection, uh, will be more restrictive when dealing with genetic information. And we see how that has materialized uh, in uh, the Oviedo Convention, which has uh, a similar uh, 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 a similar uh, section as that found in the UNESCO's declaration saying that, that genetic uh, discrimination should be prevented uh, and furthermore stipulates that genetic information should not be used outside of the health or health research context. Uh, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, and these are all uh, legally uh, constraining instruments, uh, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union uh, is uh, also uh, as included genetics uh, in uh, the characteristics in, in, in that, we're, uh, that we could not discriminate on. So it's an illicit ground of discrimination genetics uh, according to the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. And finally, more recently, the general data protection regulation has afforded a special status uh, to genetic uh, data, uh, which means that it is even more uh, protected, even more restrictively uh, by the regulation. And I'm sure some of you are even more, are, are more aware of this than, than I am uh, as to what this implies. Uh, so let's now look at an international picture of, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, so I took members of the G7, just to, it's a quick sort of exercise. What I wanna demonstrate here is that even though lots of countries have adopted anti-genetic discrimination policies, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not harmonized. It's not a, a monolithic sort of approach of anti-discrimination laws. And, and, and that's important to know uh, it, because very often people tend to think that in all sort of developed countries, we agree on, on one anti-discrimination approach. Uh, this shows that this is not the case. So you have countries here that have adopted laws to prohibit genetic discrimination, 
Uh, and, and a lot of these laws, what they do is that they, they basically prevent insurers and employers from accessing genetic test results. So uh, France, Canada, Germany are, are a good example of that. Uh, you have other countries, and Italy is an example of that, that have decided to address the case of genetics uh, through their privacy law. And, and, and by annual decree as well, which I thought was quite clever. So that's another approach. You have also countries like the United Kingdom, which have decided to process uh, by uh, through some non-legal policy. So uh, we have the code on genetic testing and insurance in the United Kingdom, which is also an interesting sort of flexible approach, uh, which can be updated uh, depending on the progress of genetics and the implications for the insurance industry. You have uh, countries uh, like the US, which, has, which have really a mix and match sort of approach to genetic discrimination, where some fields are uh, well protected like health insurance or like employment. Other fields like life insurance varies from state to state. And you have other countries that uh, like Japan have decided not to specifically address genetics in their laws. Uh, they do speak about it in their privacy law, but they do not necessarily uh, prohibit genetic discrimination, although there are discussion in the country at that, uh, at that point in time about the opportunity of doing it. Finally, closing in on the international developments, uh, we've talked a lot about genetic discrimination in insurance uh, and, and, and employment, but we shouldn't forget that sometimes what goes under the radar is discrimination uh, by governmental agencies based on, on genetic tests. And, and uh, I, I was quite happy to see uh, the European Society of Human Genetics takes a, taking a position on this uh, in, that, in that article. Uh, it is a problem and, and not just in China, but in country like the US, and I would even say in Canada where sadly some population group are more systematically targeted and, and being imposed genetic testing uh, than, than other groups. Uh, and, and again, we can come back to that. So uh, what, are, what can we conclude from this long introduction to the GDO? Well, that genetic discrimination is, involve, is an evolving phenomenon uh, that uh, there is not a single uh, law or approach that has been adopted to prevent genetic discrimination, if you look at it from an international perspective, that the phenomenon is insufficiently documented. We know there's genetic discrimination in some field. We know it's present, but we don't really know the incidence. Even uh, we know even less the impact. We know also that it is an important source of anxiety that has a negative impact on data sharing for health research. So this is where we are at this point. So why uh, did I think we needed an international observatory on genetic discrimination? Well, I think the first thing, and, and I, I think I'm preaching to the converted, is, is that we know that now health research and health care are no longer limited by national borders. Uh, we're exchanging L data. We want to share data across national boundaries because we know this is the future for health research uh, because we know that the value of information is in its richness, in its diversity. So the more we have and the more diverse group of our population are represented, the better it is. And in order to do that, we got to go beyond national borders. Uh, but of course, what that means is that you know, national laws won't protect you about what happens to your information and what's done with it in other countries. Uh, national approaches on their own have proven of limited use against genetic discrimination. I'm not at all against adopting national law to prevent genetic discrimination, but I am pointing out that a lot of these laws have not had the efficacy that they were once taught that they would have. Uh, basically 10 years, 15 years later, after some laws have been adopted, we see that in countries, genetic discrimination remains a problem. So we have to really 
think back on, well, did we really craft the laws the way they should have been crafted? And, and could we have done more or could we do still more now to improve the outlook? And there's a need for high level evidence-based consensus building on guidance and practices. So we got to do this collective exercise of developing uh, laws and practice against genetic discrimination we got to put our brains together, work together so that they are well aligned and that we do this in a scientific manner. Science progress extremely quickly in the field of genetics, so should our laws, policies, and practices to prevent genetic discrimination. And of course, to gain trust of the public and to reduce anxiety over genetic discrimination, we should use transparent and inclusive approach. So that's what the genetic discrimination is all about. It's a unique network of researchers and stakeholders uh, dedicated to researching and preventing discrimination based on genomic and other omic data worldwide. And uh, it has a big emphasis on inclusion and access of information uh, so that the public can really benefit uh, from our findings. So uh, I think the greatest strength of the observatory uh, is uh, it has taken years to create and it's really a relationship, a collaborative relationship that's been built uh, between various researchers on genetic discrimination across the world. So members of the genetic discrimination observatory represent now 20 jurisdiction, there's 22 uh, experts from 20 jurisdictions across the world. Uh, of course, the Northern Hemisphere is overrepresented uh, compared to the Southern one. Although I'm proud to say that we still have some very important country from the Southern Hemisphere represented. And of course, we're always interested in having more experts on board. But uh, this is really the strength of the observatory. Uh, that group of experts in so many countries. Patient groups are also represented on our consulta consultative committee. Uh, so the observatory has been active since 2018. And at the international level, uh, we've launched in the winter 2020 and had a publication uh, in Nature Genetics uh, about the observatory for the launch. So, what are what kind of activities? What do we concretely do and propose? Uh, real time monitoring of key metrics on genetic discrimination. So we really want to document the phenomenon scientifically. Look at incidence, impact, preventative measure, etc. We want to then, based on that evidence, develop tools, guidance, policy brief to assist stakeholders of various background to address genetic discrimination. And finally, uh, we uh, also want to foster the development of a next generation of anti-genetic discrimination researcher. And we, work, we want to work uh, together to harmonize the policies and practices of the various uh, countries uh, through stakeholders engagement. So these are the high level sort of uh, to-do list of the genetic discrimination observatory. What have we concretely done so far? So we started locally with an online forum on genetic discrimination uh, to see uh, what the population of the Canadian province of Quebec uh, felt about genetic discrimination, how much did they know about it and, and the modes of prevention, et cetera. Uh, then we quickly move to more international issues. Uh, we've developed some real-time maps to document different aspects of genetic discrimination. I'll show you some of those in a few seconds. Uh, we've also started a collaboration with the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, and I'll discuss some of the projects that we have in store here since fall 2020. Uh, we've opened a feature on our website to allow people, and it's now open for residents of Canada, US and Mexico, uh, but we want to open it for people of more countries, including European countries, to share their story if they feel that they have been discriminated uh, based on genomics characteristics. And uh, this really serves as a barometer for us to see new tendencies, new field of discrimination. For example, 
we saw a case of a person discriminated because of pharmacogenomics information that had reported to us. So this was particularly interesting because we hadn't suspected this could happen in this particular field. Uh, and uh, finally, and, and this is part of our collaboration with GA4GH, we are currently working on a Delphi exercise to identify elements of an optimal anti-genetic discrimination policy. Uh, and I will get back to that and speak more to it. So don't worry in a few seconds. So this is just to show an example uh, of a map uh, that shows all the policy. It's a map of all the policies to prevent genetic discrimination around the world. Our maps are fairly simple. The reason being we want people to access our feature even from cell phone. So we don't want things that take too much time to load. Uh, so depending on the color, uh, if it's gray, of course, it means that there is no specific protection against genetic discrimination. Dark blue hints at stronger legal protection. Uh, administrative regulations are in brown, uh, countries with uh, only ethics policies in yellow, et cetera. Uh, so uh, this is an example of what we do. And it is in real time in the sense that we have experts around the world that help us update these maps all the time. So next slide. This is a similar map for anti-genetic discrimination studies. So I told you we don't have a lot of evidence uh, on genetic discrimination. Well, so what you can see is that again, all the world area covered in gray, which is really the Southern hemisphere and Asia, uh, we have almost no study docu to document genetic discrimination that exists. Uh, the colors don't indicate the incidence of discrimination they indicate the number of studies on genetic discrimination that have been carried out on those populations. So uh, United States, of course, is where we have the most information uh, than Canada, the UK, and the rest of Europe and uh, Japan. So uh, Australia also has some, some good da data on this. This is just a picture to show you the entry point of our share your story feature. Uh, where people can report if they've been discriminated and tell their story. So I had mentioned a Delphi study that was going to take place uh, in the context of the Global Alliance. So what it is, is really we're looking for experts and some of you might be interested to participate. Uh, do contact us if that's the case. Expert in genetics, experts in bioinformatics, expert in genetics policies uh, to tell us uh, to participate in an exercise, which was really a consensus building questionnaire where we're trying to identify what elements should we ideally include in a genetic discrimination law? What's really important in a genetic discrimination law for it to work? So that's a research project that's really undertaken for GA4GH. And uh, there'll be a lot of people from that organization as well that are going to participate. And, and we're hoping that this will help us model uh, uh, a really uh, a, a better uh, anti-genetic discrimination policy than those that are in existence uh, right now. So I know that time is flying and I'm going to close the presentation uh, just uh, mentioning what are some of the challenges and opportunities ahead for the genetic discrimination observatory. So things that we've done really well so far, uh, visibility, press coverage, and scholarly publication have been really good for the observatory so far. In the sense that there is an interest, people in the genetic community know that this is a big issue, know that solutions are needed, uh, and, and the quality of our research has been recognized. We've got publication in very good journals. So this has really worked well. Collaboration and, and uh, collaboration and uh, engagement with patient uh, is good, but we want it to be even better. Uh, it is really difficult to collaborate on an international scale uh, with researchers, uh, engaging patient. Uh, it takes a lot of time and, and energy. So this is something that's a work in progress. And, and that's one of our key priority for the next year. Sustainability is a challenge. 
Uh, one of the reasons for that is that when you talk about genetic discrimination, this is something very personal for many people. So people uh, tend to have a very clear cut opinions on, on what we should do about genetic discrimination. Uh, and, and we wanna keep a scientific approach to the phenomenon. So we would not like to be you know, funded uh, by people with a, a clear agenda that wouldn't allow us to do the research that needs to be done to document and, and prevent the problem. So uh, to remain sustainable and at the same time sort of clear up conflict of interest uh, is, is, is a challenge and uh, the kind of research that we do because it takes so many people from so many countries, it is expensive research. So sustainability uh, is a challenge, another priority issue that we need to, to tackle uh, for the coming years. So on that note, I'm happy to address uh, any questions that you may have, uh, and thanks for listening. Uh, I do want to thank uh, a couple of people, uh, and as you can see, it's a large team. Uh, so there you go. Thank you very much, and uh, David, we could open it to question if you'd like. Mm -hmm.